Hello, everybody, and welcome to the eighth session of the Pixel Project's sixth fall edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. My name is Anusha Kandasivam. I'm your moderator for this session. Through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 14 award-winning and best-selling authors to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds for the Pixel Project to keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking. Uh, I'll be telling you a little bit more about the Read for Pixels fundraiser a little later in the session. We have lots and lots of exclusive author goodies. But meanwhile, if you want to find out more about the Pixel Project, uh, go to www.thepixelproject.com. Sorry, .net. <laughs> So for today, we have an amazing guest. We have a live discussion and Q&A session with the critically acclaimed science fiction and fantasy author, Nicholas Eames. So uh, here he is. There he is. Hi. Hi, Nicholas. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to give you guys a little short introduction in case you don't know. Nicholas was born in Ontario, Canada. He's the author of the rollicking fantasy adventure novels, Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose. He loves black coffee, neat whiskey, the month of October, and video games. He currently lives in Kingston, and he's probably writing at this very moment. So it says, I must be. <laughs> uh, I can't see my toes, so hard <laughs> yeah. at work. Nicholas has uh, really generously donated some amazing treats for donors worldwide to the stash of author goodies we have set up as perks for donors at the Reaper Pixels Rally Up fundraising page. So uh, let me tell you about them. Uh, I'll put myself back on for just a little while. So uh, there are two bundles that, uh, sorry, two things that Nicholas has donated. Goodie number one is the Great Canadian Book Plus Haiku Bundle. So Nicholas and Charles Dillins, yes, that Charles Dillins, have teamed up to put together a unique Canadian fantasy bundle. So this is what it is. Nicholas Eames is offering a signed and personalized set of his smash hit series, The Band, the UK trade paperback edition, featuring Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose. And award-winning fantasy author and father of urban fantasy, Charles Lind, is offering one coveted spot on his exclusive haiku mailing list. He writes and sends a haiku a day to a selected group of only 25 people. Now, unfortunately for all of you, this goodie bundle has already been snapped up by Deborah Thomas from the US. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, you are a very lucky girl. You to get the haiku and also get the the personalized and signed uh, set from Nicholas. Now, goodie number two is still available, and there is also only one of this available to uh, anyone worldwide. So if you live outside of Ontario and you've ever wished to meet Nicholas in person to have a chat about his books, about writing fantasy, and even that eternal question, where does he get all his hilarious ideas from, now is your chance. Nicholas has very generously donated a one-to-one -one Skype chat for one hour to be claimed by one Read for Pixels donor. Nicholas says he's willing to talk about anything at all, and he will even give you tips on writing um, and share his insights and experience with you. Now, the Skype call can be for a single person or for a book club. Uh, so there's only one of this, so please go get it. We've raised so far $1,300 towards our $5,000 goal which is actually our slowest fundraiser yet. So please do give generously before the fundraiser ends in October. All funds go towards the Pixel Project's work to help end violence against women. Uh, so I will tell you a bit more about how you can get your hands on all this on the stuff uh, a little later in the session. But meanwhile, Nicholas is going to do a reading, and we're going to have a live discussion and Q&A session, which you guys can participate in. So you're, you'll be watching this on YouTube. Go to the there'll be a chat box on the right-hand side of your page, right-hand side. Uh, you have to sign in, but then you can type your questions in, and one of our moderators, Samantha or Denisha, will relay the questions to us, and Nicholas will answer them. So now I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas. Uh, why don't you tell us what you're going to read? All right, so I'm going to read uh, just a tiny bit of, uh, of Bloody Rose, which is my second book in the band series. Um, as you can see, I've got this beautiful red-edged hardcover here. Um, and I'm going to read um, just the, la or the second half of the first chapter. I timed myself today, and my first attempt was 14 minutes, and so I cut part out, and now it's down to 10 minutes and 30 oh. seconds. So. <laughs> we'll see. I'll read, I'll read quick. Uh, it's OK. Take your time. Also, I'll be attempting very hard not to swear. 
So my God, bear with me. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. Uh, anyway, so I'll set it up first. So Tam Hashford is my main character. Um, she is the daughter of a very overprotective father um, and a mother who passed away in the line of duty. She was a bard. Um, and bards are, they kind of, in my setting, they kind of follow these bands around, the mercenary bands, and they kind of pump their tires and sing songs about them and, and generally make them famous. And so uh, as a consequence of um, her mother's death, Tam is not allowed to associate with any uh, of that sort. Um, but every day on the way to her job, which is slinging drinks, um, at the local bar, she takes a walk through the monster market, which is where um, all the all the uh, fighters go to choose what kind of monster they're going to fight in the arena the next day. So my scene is from that uh, and introduces the titular character, Bloody Rose, at the end. Tuck Hashford had a rule about his only daughter going anywhere near the monster market or the arena or associating with mercenaries in general. No way. Despite that, Tam often took this route on her way to work, not because it was quicker, but because it quickened something inside her. It scared her, thrilled her, reminded her of the stories her mother used to tell, of daring quests and wild adventure, of fearsome beasts and valiant heroes like her father and Uncle Bran. Also, since Tam would likely spend her whole life slinging drinks and playing loot for coppers here in Wintry Ardberg, a stroll through the monster market was the closest she'd ever come to adventure. Look here, called a heavily tattooed Narmiri woman as Tam passed by. You want ogres? I've got ogres. Fresh from the hills of West Spring, fierce as they come. Manticore, shouted a northerner with a shaved head and savage scars marring his face. Manticore! There was, indeed, a real live manticore behind him. Its bat-like wings were bound by chains, its barbed tail trapped inside a leather sack. A muzzle was clamped over its leonine jaw. But despite its captivity, the creature still managed to look terrifying. Wargs of the Winter Forest, another merchant announced, above a chorus of deep growls. Wild-born, farm-raised. Goblins, an old lady hollowed from atop an iron-barred wagon. Get your goblins here, one quart mark apiece, or a dozen for ten. Tam peered into the cage upon which the old woman stood. It was cramped with filthy little creatures, most of which looked scrawny and malnourished. She doubted even, even a dozen of them would give a band of half-decent mercenaries a run for their money. Hey, the woman hollered down at her. This ain't a dress shop, girl. Now buy a bloody goblin or get on with you. Tam tried to imagine what her father would say if she came home with a pet goblin in tow and couldn't help but grin. No way, she muttered. She walked on, weaving through the throng of bookers and local wranglers as they bartered and bargained with scale merchants and rugged Kaskar huntsmen. She did her best not to gawk openly at the varied monsters of the merchants peddling them. Tam! Willow! She trotted over to her friend's stall. Willow was an islander from the Silk Coast bronze skin and big for his kind. She'd remarked when they first met that Willow was a curious name for a guy his size, and he'd said that it was because a willow tree provided shade to everything around it. Which made a lot of sense when you put it that way. Willow's black curls bounced as he shook his head. Cutting through the mo monster market again. What would old Tuck say if he found out? I think we both know the answer to that, she said with a grin. How's business? Booming! He gestured to his wares. A variety of winged serpents in wicker cages behind him. Before long, every home in Ardberg will have their very own Xanto. They make excellent pets, you know. Great with kids. Provided those kids don't mind having corrosive acid spat in their faces from time to time. Also, they can't stand the cold up here, and I will, and will very probably be dead inside a month. Next time I go home, I'm bringing back lobsters instead. I could sell lobsters. Easy. Tam nodded, despite having no idea what sort of monster a lobster was. Willow toyed idly with one of several shell necklaces he was wearing. Hey, did you hear the news? There's another horde, apparently, north of Cragmore in the Bruma Wastes. Fifty thousand monsters hell-bent on invading Granule. They say the leader is a giant by the name of Brontide, Tam finished. I know. I work in a tavern, remember? If there's a rumor to be heard, I've heard it. Did you know the Sultana of Narmir is actually a boy wearing a woman's mask? That can't be true. Or that the seamstress who killed her husband down in Rutherford is claiming to be the Winter Queen herself? I seriously doubt that. How about the one where the sound of cheering interrupted her? Both of them turned to see a commotion in the nearest cross street, and a smile split Tam's face from ear to ear. Looks like the party's come to town, said Willow. Tam shot him a pleading glance, and the islander sighed dramatically. Go, he told her. Say hi to Bloody Rose for me. Tam spared her friend a smile before bolting away. 
She ducked around the bulk of a shaggy ethic, then slipped between a shouting huntsman and a barking wrangler an instant before the huntsman launched a punch that put the wrangler on his bum. I didn't swear. <laughs> she reached the next street as the first Argosy was approaching and wormed her way to the front of the crowd. Hey, watch where... A boy her age with a hawkish nose and limp blonde hair turned his affronted scowl into what he probably thought was a charming smile. Ah, sorry. A pretty girl like you can stand wherever she'd like, of course. Ugh, she thought. Thanks, she said, choosing a falsely bright smile over an exaggerated eye roll. You come to see the mercenaries, he asked. No, I came to watch the horses. Swear word, swear word. I did, she answered. Me too, he said and then tapped the lute slung over his shoulder. I'm a bard. Oh, with what band? Well, I, I don't have one yet, he said defensively, but it's only a matter of time. She nodded distractedly as the lead Argosy rolled up. The massive war wagon was bigger than the house Tam shared with her father. It was draped in leather skins and drawn by a pair of woolly white mammoths with streamers tied to their tusks. The mercenaries to whom it belonged stood around a stout siege tower built on top, waving their weapons at the crowd massed along either side of the avenue. That's giant Spain, said the boy next to her, as if the North's favored sons required an introduction. The mercenaries, all of them big, bearded cascars, were regulars at the tavern where Tam worked. And their leader gave her a wave as the Argosy went by. The self-styled bard glanced over, bewildered. You know Alcane Tor? Tam did her best to ignore his tone and shrugged. Sure. The boy frowned, but said nothing further. A hundred or so mercenaries on foot and horseback came next, and Tam picked out a few bands she recognized from the Cornerstone Commons. The Locksmiths, the Black Puddings, the Boils, and Nightmare. Riff Raff, sneered the boy. He paused, clearly wanting Tam to ask for clarification. When she didn't, he clarified anyway. Most of these lesser knowns will wrestle with trash imps and guild halls and private arenas tonight, but the bigger bands, Giant Spain, for instance, or Fable, will fight in the ravine tomorrow in front of thousands. The ravine, Tam asked. She knew damn well what the ravine was, but if this blowhard was going to talk, then Tam figured she might as well choose the subject. It's Ardberg's arena, the boy droned on as a caravan of Argosies rumbled past. Though it's not much to look at, really. Not a real arena like the ones down south. I was in Five Court last summer, you know. Their new arena is the biggest in all the world. They call it, look, someone shouted, saving Tram, Tam the trouble of ramming her fist down her new friend's throat in an effort to shut him up. It's them. It's Fable. Rolling up next was an Argosy drawn by eight big draft horses in draconic, bronze-scale barding. The war wagon was a fortress grinding over sixteen stone wheels, with iron slats on the windows and barbed chain screens hung over the side. In her periphery, Tam saw the boy straighten and puff out his chest like a bullfrog about to bellow a mating call. That's the rebel's readout, Tam said, before this idiot could tell her something else she already knew. It belongs to Fable who've only been together for four and a half years, but are arguably the most famous mercenary band in the world. You see, she went on, slathering every word in cloying condensation. Most bands only fight in arenas. They tour from town to town and take on whatever the local wranglers have on hand, which is great because everyone, from the wranglers to the bookers to the arena managers, heck, sometimes even the mercs themselves get paid, and the rest of us get a hell of a show. Mercs is short for mercenaries, by the way. The boy gaped. I know, but fable. Tam cut him off. Well, they do things the old way. They still tour, obviously, but they take on contracts that most other bands wouldn't dare. They've hunted giants and burned pirate fleets to cinders. They've killed sand maws in Dumidia and once slew a furball king right here in Kaskar. She pointed to a barrel-chested northerner sitting between two crenellations, his tangle of brown hair obscuring most of his face. That's Brun. He's sort of a local legend. He's a Vargir. A Vargir? Here, we call them shamans, Tam explained. He can change into a great big bear at will. Now the one in black with half her head shaved and tattoos all over? She's the sorceress, a summoner, actually. Her name's Cura, but people call her the Ink Witch. And see the Druin, Free Cloud? He's the tall one with green hair and ears like a rabbit. They say he's the very last of his kind, and that he's never made a wager he didn't win, and that his sword, Madrigal, can cut through steel like it was silk. The boy's face had gone an exceptionally gratifying shade of scarlet. Okay, listen, he said. Except Tam was all done listening. And that, she pointed to the woman standing with one boot on the battlement above them, is Bloody Rose. She's the leader of Fable, the savior of the city of Castia, and very probably the most dangerous woman this side of the Heartwild. Tam fell silent as the Argosy's shadow enveloped them. 
She'd never actually seen Bloody Rose before, but she knew every story, had heard every song, had seen the warrior's likeness on walls or sketched on posters around town, though chalk and charcoal hardly did the real thing justice. Fable's front woman wore a piecemeal suit of dull black plate slashed with red, except her gauntlets, which gleamed like new steel. They were drew and forged, or so the songs alleged, and matched to the scimitars, thistle and thorn, she wore in scabbards on either hip. Her hair was dyed a bright, bloody red, and hacked off at the hard line of her chin. Half the girls in town had the same cut, the same color. Tam herself had gone so far as to buy a sack of hucknall beans, which bled their crimson coats when soaked in water. But her father had guessed her intent and demanded she eat them one by one in front of him. They tasted like lemons with a cinnamon rind, and had left her lips, tongue, and teeth so red it looked as if she'd torn the throat out of a deer. Her hair, for all her trouble she'd gone to, remained the unremarkable brown it had always been. The Argosy passed, leaving Tam to blink like a dreamer roused by the slanting afternoon light. Beside her, the boy had finally found his voice, though he cleared his throat before trying it out. Well, you really know your stuff, huh? Do you want to uh, grab a drink at the Cornerstone? The Cornerstone? Yeah, it's just... Tam was off, sprinting as fast as her legs would carry her. Not only was she hopelessly late for work, but her father, naturally, had yet another rule when it came to his daughter going for drinks with strange boys which suited Tam just fine, since she was into girls anyway. End of chapter one. Uh, that was so fun, so great. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> and thank you for um, not swearing. Yeah, didn't I do good? <laughs> yes, <you laughs> There was a few well. more swear words than I thought in there. But <laughs> um, you got to set the tone early. Yeah, we try. Um, so before I, uh, there are already some, a few questions coming in, and uh, guys, I'm going to get to your questions in a bit. And I have a few questions of my own, but before I get to those, um, I just want to talk about the little bit of mansplaining that was going on there, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and the way that Tam uh, handled it. That was pretty cool. How, why did you put that in? Because mansplaining is a real issue, and it needs <laughs> to be addressed. Um, and that's, I mean, especially why I chose that scene. I mean, I think I, I, uh, I don't know. I like it. It's something that a lot of people would read and. You know, if they're maybe not as aware of the issue um, as they should be, they might go, "Okay, I see what I see what just happened there." But mm -hmm. mostly, it was just kind of an in joke for people that realize what it was and thought, do you "Yeah." Think, do, do you think some people just don't realize what's happening? Yep, tons of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. That's weird. Uh, and by the way. Um, I, I really like the way you wrote uh, Tam's reactions because when that boy said, a pretty girl like you can't, can stand wherever you like, I actually said erg and rolled my eyes to myself. <laughs> just Excellent. Tam did it. So well done on that. So um, uh, moving, going on from that, so you have some really cool, interesting female characters in your books. So you have had a little criticism for making Kings of the Wild, a book with an all-male main cast with mm -hmm. very few female characters, but they it still does feature some interesting female characters with agency. Um, there's Clay's wife, who earns more than he does, and even the female bandits who rob Clay and Gabe, of, you know, of their coin and their sandwiches and their socks. And uh, we just saw Bloody Rose and we just saw Tam. So can you tell us uh, who or what are your inspirations for your female characters? Um, well, some of them are drawn off of traits uh, that my real life friends possess. Um, whether it's their empathy or their attitude or something about them, um, their way of speaking. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I think I approach a lot of my characters the same way. And the fact that you just have to put yourself in their shoes uh, in so much as you can and, and write them honestly, as honestly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Bloody Rose. Now, her rescue from Castia is basically the catalyst for the quest in Kings of the Wild. Mm -hmm. And she is one of the main characters in Lady Rose. But she's always striving to get out from under the shadow of her famous father. And she consequently runs a lot more risk than is prudent. And when she becomes a famous hero in a ho her own right, she does leave her young daughter behind as she and her band tour and fight monsters. Uh, Rose's experience shows that motherhood is not always the wonderful, life-enhancing, amazing experience that cultures keep telling women that it is. And uh, you don't shy away from that aspect of being a woman that mothers are also human and they do make mistakes. How do you strike that note of empathy and humanity when writing about mothers and their complicated relationships with motherhood? That is an amazing question. 
Um, well, that's what I think makes is the most interesting thing about Rose, um, ultimately. Um, because obviously she's got a lot going on. She's a bit of an addict. She's obviously got some issues with her family. Um, but the fact that she had a child with someone that she loved and that person that she loved wanted a child, but it just wasn't in her game plan and isn't the most important thing to her, even though that maybe, you know, may change over the course of her life kind of thing. Um, but I think it's, I think it's rare to see, I'm sure it's like more, more prevalent than I know, but rare to see, at least the books that I've read, um, someone who's a mother, but it's not the, their defining characteristic. And so often, like how many, you know, male characters in books have kids at home and they're off at war doing whatever. And it's not even mm -hmm. blinked at, not even thought about. Um, and yet it becomes a bigger deal when suddenly it's the mother's not there to provide this care for a daughter. So um, I thought it was important just to show that aspect of life and to make a character who was very fallible. Um, and just in general, like Rose is based off of a lot of, a lot of um, kind of those, those excessive rockers from the 1980s who, mm -hmm. yep, they had their kids and yep, they loved their kids, but they still hit the road. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of mom, I think your mom has just commented. She says, hi, oh, yeah. John, you're doing great. <laughs> there she is. There she is. Hi, hi, hi mom. mom. <laughs> hi, mom's friends. <laughs> it's cool that your mom is so supportive. Um, uh, so, um, okay, so my next question is, uh, now all genres have their shares of female stereotypes and tropes, uh, as we can see from that hashtag men writing women, uh, which, you know, is full of hilarious, really, sometimes idiotic things. Uh, many male authors just can't seem to write female characters well. What are some of the methods that you have used to break stereotypes in creating and writing female characters, such as Rose? Um, well, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, I think ultimately just not, not holding them to a certain, you know, to a certain standard based on their gender. Uh, you want to kind of make a world where I'm, I'm trying to make a world at least in my books where people are treated a lot more equally, um, whether it's their gender or their sexuality. And yeah, I think it's just a matter of not making their gender necessarily their defining characteristic. It's their, their character itself, their personality, what they want out of life. And I think what someone wants out of life in an equal and fair world doesn't depend on, you know, anything else but themselves. So just, yeah, approach them honestly, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people seem to forget that women are also people. And uh, you just write them as people and then it kind of works out, right? 100%. And, and yeah, <laughs> it's not like I, I don't think I overly described anyone's physical characteristics too much. Um, and yet I'm, I, it was important to me to at least make mention, which is one other thing that's kind of rarely seen in the books that I read at least a lot by written by men of uh, menstrual cycles. And they're in there mm. because boy, mm. oh boy, you got three women in a band. You're not going to, if you're just going to gloss over it, you're just missing the point of writing. Yeah. About. There's so many of these books where all these women go on amazing adventures and across the world. And then nobody ever mentions getting your period and what you do about it. <laughs> Come on. Totally. <laughs> it's not like, it doesn't like, I, I don't like, I, I don't sideline the book for it or anything like yeah. that. But it was important to me. Even, even I remember starting out writing Kings of the Wild. Uh, my main character uh, literally stops to pee on the side of the road in the first chapter. And mm -hmm. it was because I was like, I want to make a book where people stop to pee. Like, <laughs> it just seems more honest to me. Like, yeah. Yeah. The same, the same goes for, for every biological aspect of life. <laughs> um, okay, so. Bloody Rose in particular is, has definitely passed the Bechdel test it has inclu with the inclusion of complex relationships between women. Why do you think many SFF authors still have trouble writing stories that pass the Bechdel test despite the fact that there are many more things that women talk about other than men? And uh, what, do you, what can you suggest for writers who want to write female conversations and relationships realistically? Um, well, the reason I, I think a lot of people just, they've grown up reading a lot of male authors, um, at least my generation. Um, and it just doesn't 
it, they just don't think about it enough. Uh, I think going forward, we'll, we'll see a lot more more equality that way, and I think we're already seeing it. But I think for especially in the past, you just kind of didn't. It just didn't cross your mind, or didn't cross people's mind enough um, for them to include that. And it does. It's crazy, obviously, how many books do not pass that test. Um, and like you said earlier, I know with Kings of the Wild, like I based that band off of like pretty much Led Zeppelin in particular. So mm -hmm. it was it was all guys. And so I I tried to populate it as much as I can the rest of the world with female characters and and. Uh, someone did once say that all your female characters are bad guys. I'm like, well, they're not the good guys, so they got to be somebody. But to be perfectly honest, some of the best characters in that book, like the most good people, like Jane, who robs the band, is a wonderful, wonderful person. And probably the, actually the, the best person of all of them, um, arguably. Maybe, maybe Moog's close. But um, anyways, yeah, when it comes to just, just be more mindful of it to other authors, I think I think most people get, get a hang of, get the hang of it and especially these days, publishers, I think, like, would be mindful of it as well, I would hope at least. Um, they're looking for a lot more diversity in books um, from what I've seen. So I think the publisher is going to be a check on that, and the authors themselves just try to make sure you, you know, every, any character, you make a shopkeeper, you make a, you talk about, you know, a hero from the past. It's like, why not make them a woman? Just mm. don't just, I mean, I think it's, you know, a lot of people have this tendency like you if you're a guy you assume dogs are men if you're you know so it's a, too much of a de facto thing and people need to just be a bit more mindful of including everyone mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, somebody had mentioned that most of your villains are women do you ever feel pressured by gender and cultural stereotypes to make your female characters likable or relatable and do you ever get any flack for not making a female character likable enough uh I don't definitely don't feel pressure to because, you know, like I like I responded to that one person before, and I'm like, all my characters are they're mostly reprehensible. Some of them have something going on that they're not. No one's perfect. Um, but no, because m I'm more kind of uh, thinking about I'm being inspired by musicians and. So the people in the Kings of the Wild are, are inspired by 70s musicians who were, yeah, they were like getting a little reckless and wild and, and sexual, but they were still a bit more wholesome, I feel. Whereas Bloody Rose takes place or is represented by 80s music. And boy, oh boy, if you watch a documentary on, you know, Van Halen or Guns N' Roses or any of the bands, Stevie Nicks, any of the bands that were going around at that time, they were just nuts. Like I, I when I wrote my first draft of the book and then I read a couple biographies from these people and I'm like, I have to ratchet it up a little bit because these people were debauched. <laughs> um, and so Rose, yeah, I mean, some people have said they can't relate to Rose and they don't like Rose. And I'm like, well, guess what? If you were on Axl Rose's tour, you wouldn't like him either. Like he was a real bastard to a lot of people. So um, Rose is supposed to be like that. She's supposed to be kind of a brash and, and brutish front woman. And uh, I, so I definitely don't feel compelled to Make make them nice, but. Mm -hmm. Hey, cool. Um, speaking of musicians, uh, J A has a, a kind of appropriate question. So he or she, I'm sorry, I don't know. Thinks um, or they can uh, ask them um, if Kings of the Wild was 70s rock and Bloody Rose is 80s music. Uh, if and tell us if you agree about uh, agree about that. Uh, yep. What will book three have a basis in? The 90s. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's the next logical step. Like grunge. Uh, yeah, um, probably more the early '90s and the late '90s because the late '90s was poisoned by boy bands. Mm. Um, it's and, controversial. I don't right, know. Right. I mean, I love the Backstreet Boys as much as the next person, um, but um, just as far as the music of that era that's most inspiring to me, at least, um, mm -hmm. is the early '90s hip hop and the grunge. Mm -hmm. But more the hip hop, to be perfectly honest. Um, well, it well it is a lot harder to write to. Like boy, writing the '70s music, and you're right, Kings of the Wild is, is '70s, a little bit '60s even too. Um, '70s music is so easy to write to because it's it's these ten minute long, you know, rambling epics. Yeah. And it's just or Pink Floyd, it's 17 minutes long of just like space sounds. 
um, and then like a goat comes on and mules or something. But so it's super easy to write to. And then 80s music is way more difficult because these people were singing with their heart on their sleeve and they're like, oh my God, I'm so in love or I'm so heartbroken or, you know, or it switches between the two in the course of one song. You get people like Meatloaf and Heart. Um, and those songs are, I mean, they're really, really inspiring and they're fun and they're like excellent and they inspire great scenes, but they're hard to write to. And um, hip hop and grunge is especially hard to write to because, especially hip hop, because it's so many lyrics. And if you're not listening to the lyrics, you're, you're missing it. And, but it is by far the most inspiring because it's got the most to say about, um, about what the people that wrote it were experiencing in a really, really genuine way, as opposed to songwriters in the eighties were just kind of writing, I think to impress an audience. Whereas yeah. the, the hip hop artists in the nineties were writing to, to uh, explain, try to get the word out about what they were going through. So speaking of hip hop, Missy, serious like that, East Coast, West Coast, or Asia? <laughs> <laughs> Funny, I just finished today. I finished season three of the evolution of hip hop, um, which has taught me a lot. Um, yeah, I would say East Coast primarily, but a little bit of West Coast, and we'll see about Atlanta. They were late to the party, so. Uh, <laughs> um, speaking of boy bands, uh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, East Coast somebody's... boy bands. Boy band. Uh, no, so someone Arthur Elliot says, "Can there be a boy band like a counter mark band?" I've definitely considered it. I've definitely considered it. I did. I remember I did mention somebody's like nickname was the Backstreet Boy or something like that. <laughs> um, I can't imagine I'll get through this whole book without putting a joke in there somewhere about boy bands for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and just a quick comment from uh, RCA seven seven seven. Uh, after a decade or so of not picking up a book, Kings of the Wild snatched my attention with the depth of the lore. Impatience ensued until Bloody Rose was unleashed. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank, thank you. That. I really, really appreciate that. <laughs> I think we all feel like that. Um, okay, so keep your questions pouring in, guys, and I'll try to get through all of them. But uh, I'm going to go back to one of my questions first. So um, let's talk about the male and female relationships in your books. Mm -hmm. uh, they're generally quite equitable. And your male characters are respectful of women, of their thoughts and their decisions. Uh, for example, Clay Cooper, he's pretty proud that his wife earned five times more than him. And uh, Bloody Rose's father gave Thodha to wield a sword and only made half-hearted attempts to stop her from adventuring. Uh, and despite there being very few women and girls in Kings of the Wild, what is interesting is that the two main characters, uh, Clay and Gabe, they're pretty much introduced in relation to their daughters. Clay has prioritized being a family man in his middle age. He, he listens to his daughter's advice to help Gabe go after Rose. And Gabe dr basically dragged all his former bandmates together out of retirement as a dad who's hell-bent on rescuing his daughter. Uh, why did you decide to make fatherhood, specifically a formerly alpha male fathering, uh, fathers parenting their daughters, uh, one of the themes of the book? Um, well, it's when I first started it, it just basically like honestly those first three chapters kind of wrote themselves to be honest i was in the midst of writing another book on it entirely and got the idea for the whole band as mercenaries thing so i um just wrote started writing the scene and and i don't know just clay cooper himself i wanted to as a character i wanted to i mean a shout out to my mom here but she used to read us the poem if all the time by rudyard kipling and it's you know, it ain't, it's not a perfect poem, but it's got some really commendable lines in it, some things that are, you know, some values that are worth trying to live up to. And Clay Cooper was kind of the epitome of that. He was like, who would somebody be uh, if eventually at the end of his road, he got to be the person, the kind of person that my mom was trying to raise, you know, or my parents were trying to raise. So I just wanted to be good and, and things like Gabe's predicament and, 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 Clay's daughter just kind of came pretty organically. Um, a lot of people ask me if I have a daughter because those, you know, just the way the way Clay and his daughter scenes are written. But I, I don't. I have a niece now who I adore, but she wasn't around at the time. And honestly, I think I like looking back, knowing my niece now. I probably wrote Clay's daughter a little too young for her age, but that's maybe a personal nitpick. 
but otherwise, yeah, I mean, ultimately family, like I, I said earlier, just, I, I like making things like, even when they're dire, things kind of like happy and cozy and, and feel familiar. And so family is obviously a huge, huge driving factor in both books. Um, obviously it's fathers and their daughters in the first one and daughters and their fathers in the second one. And mm -hmm. the third one, it'll be every sort of family relationship you can imagine. Okay. Do you think uh, reframing how stories describe men away from hostile and toxic stereotypes and toward complexity and even vulnerability like we see in, in your book can be one of the ways SFF writers can break away from toxic tropes that promote toxic masculinity and the de dehumanization of women? I really, really, really hope so. Um, and I have got um, a lot of lots of positive feedback on those scenes. I think men and women both relate to them, scenes where, where you know, there's a part of the King in Kings of the Wild where they, you know, they just hug each other and tell everyone they love each other. And that's important. I, I do that to my male friends all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people do. And so, yeah, I think ultimately just portraying, like we had, see, we had back in the day, we had all these heroic tropes, these characters that were, you know, pretty two dimensional. And then we mm -hmm. all went through that grim dark phase, uh, which I read a lot and tried to write some of and, and loved reading where our characters got more realistic, but they got more realistic in a gritty, sometimes mean spirited, morally gray way, which is great because they became more realistic, but at the same time, it wasn't fully fleshed out. Um, so in writing Kings of the Wild and going forward, and I think of a lot of writers are trying to do the same thing is capturing every part of the human experience, whether it's the humor, whether it's the, um, adoration for your friends and your family, the vulnerability, you know, sometimes the, the tempers and the anger and things like that. Mm -hmm. I just think hopefully we're moving to a place where we can see all those aspects of men and women um, with each other. Mm -hmm. Do you think that eventually this uh, violent alpha male type character would phase out of SSF as cultures worldwide sort of start kicking out mes toxic masculinity? Or do you think it's one of the stereotypes that's going to stick around for much longer than expected? I do think it'll probably stick around for longer than expected, but at the same time, um, people can write it all they want, but publishers themselves are becoming, are pretty, you know, fair-minded these days, and they're becoming a lot more progressive and, and trying, I think, uh, and hope going forward to give you know, everyone a fair shake. And I think that you'll see a lot more, you just won't see that kind of stuff published as much as you maybe would have in the past. They'll all, they'll probably always be a, you know, you're going to, you're going to have evil characters in your book and you're going to have, you know, people that aren't perfect and people that are, you know, pure villains. Um, but I think that we see, I mean, a lot of the books that are coming out nowadays and popular nowadays do not have any sort of aggressive male character as the main character. Yeah, I so think it's bigger, but I don't think it. I think we're it's done flourishing. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's that's it's the it's good. I guess. <laughs> good I to hope. know. Yeah. That's yeah. only my opinion. I could be I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, guys who are watching, there we have quite a lot, number of people watching and asking questions. Uh, what do you think? Do you think these toxic male stereotypes are phasing out, or do you think they're here to stay? And uh, while you think about that, I have some questions from the fans. So RCA777 has another question. If you had 30 seconds to choose a name brand for your own whiskey, what that was related to, related to an element in your book, what would it be? 30 hmm. seconds. Let's go with Moog's magic phallic phylactery. <laughs> I mean, straight out of the books and it would make a heck of a whiskey. Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably make you go blind. <laughs> yeah, well, if that's a side effect, that's maybe one that some men would be willing to uh, risk. Mm. Okay. Um, J.A. asks, how has Dungeons & Dragons influenced your writing specifically? Has it? So much. Uh, I actually thought about this. I was answering interview questions yesterday and talking about inspirations. I think getting introduced to Dungeons & Dragons when I did, I don't think I was 13 at the time. It's probably because I didn't write before that. And playing that was what you'd want to make an adventure for your friends. And you'd want to make it as exciting as possible. And you'd want to make some twists and you want to shock them and you want to, you know, 
kill characters they love and put them in dire situations and and doing that for my brother and and my friends i think is what had a major major impact on me wanting to write and you know helping a little bit to develop those skills early even though they were a long way from developing fully um but yeah i think it played a huge impact and even just i think you can see it not only in the in the monsters that inhabit the world but just the way the characters interact because when you play dungeons and dragons when i play dungeons and dragons i know some people take it very seriously but we do not um every time we roll 20 we have a swig of whiskey no Every time we roll 20, we have a handful of M&Ms. And every time we roll a 1, we have a swig of really, really terrible alcohol. Um, so, boy, when you've got a mouthful of M&Ms and suddenly you roll a 1, it is something special. Um, but, yeah, we just we laugh our way through it, and it's just nonstop hilarity the whole way through. So at Dungeon, the way I play Dungeons & Dragons is the way I write. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Another question from Many Space Mechanics. With the fan reactions, have you seen a lot of fan art or fan works created? And what is it like seeing other people building up your works? And what is the coolest or weirdest things you've seen? Any song? Um, good question. Thanks again for all these questions everyone asking. Um, <laughs> there has been one song, at least. There's also been a soundscape that was super cool. Someone did a, a version of when in the first book when the band's waiting to have their first arena fight they're in this tunnel they're waiting to go into the maxathon and you hear the crowd shouting saga saga and it gets louder as they go out and the crowd roars this up uh, someone like did that whole sound set it to led zeppelin music and it was so amazing um otherwise the fan art i've been blown away by it like you never expect it i still remember the exactly the first moment i saw the first piece of fan art for Kings of the Wild, I was like, oh, that's that's a pretty awesome wyvern. And then I'm like, huh, there's the word Kings of the Wild under this post. And then I just like took me a second to really grasp what was happening. And I was just blown away. And uh, there's been so much of it. Every time I see it, I just kind of am in disbelief for a moment that someone's taken the time to, um, you know, use their talent um, to express something from my from my own imagination so it's been yeah immensely rewarding and i am so grateful for all of it that's really cool um another question from arthur Iliad. Iliad, have you ever thought of doing a collab with someone i know it would never happen but i would love to see something from you and pierce Brown. <laughs> um yeah perfect can i have his hair too <laughs> um, uh yeah i would do a collab with someone i mean it would probably I've, t I've talked with some people about doing like a graphic novel collaboration. Um, obviously that's more with an artist um, than a writer. Um, but I honestly think at the moment, at least I kind of write too slow to collaborate with someone. I could probably collaborate with Patrick Rothfuss pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, I just can't, I couldn't condemn someone to my writing <laughs> at the moment, but I do plan on getting better at it. Um, but yeah, I would, I mean, in, in any other format it would be great. And obviously, I mentioned I'm just starting to, I'll divulge more about it on social media some other time, but I've started writing a video game, so that's a pretty collaborative process. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not a major, major part of it, really, but yeah, it's really fun. Okay. Um, Manifest Mechanics says, you roll a one and have a swig of magic moves, Magnificent Phallic <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well then, let me just have some right here. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Mm. Oh, this is going to get interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Delish. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, genres and sto storytelling, because stories are one of the most powerful ways of bringing about cultural change. Uh, so epic fantasy in general is well known for its male-dominated cast. However, over the past 25 years, authors such as Steven Erickson, Adrian Tchaikovsky, Lynn Fowelli, and yourself have been pushing back against the status quo to write epic fantasy that strongly repudiates toxic masculinity. Uh, do you think this pushback against toxic mas masculinity in epic fantasy is just a trend? Or is it a bellwether of the changes in society that are happening as, as everybody worldwide starts dealing with the damage that absolute male privilege has brought, has done to the world? Oh, it's here to stay, I think, for sure. Um, like, because it's just this, I mean, it's better. It's better. Like, Steven Erickson's world is better for having all those female characters in it. And that's what I loved about reading Steven Erickson is that 
um, he was almost he was one of the first authors I've ever read that his his female and male characters were not at all defined by their gender. I mean, Robert Jordan, so I remember Robert Jordan growing up, and mm-hmm. his characters were, even though his female characters were, you know, arguably, but some of them were really great. I loved them. Um, but that world very much had gender roles, whereas Steven Erickson's does not. And you can be whatever you want to be in that world. And some of like his most incredible characters were women and I just yeah I that was a huge inspiration when I go when I go forward and think about you know when you make a new character it's like he he just seemed to flip a coin um and yeah I think he did a great job of it okay um now your books aren't sort of your your usual straight epic fantasy but like a comedy epic fantasy you very skillfully skewer a whole bunch of stale genre archetypes and stereotypes what do you think comedy can do with which other genres can't to address violence against women? Um, well, it's not necessarily a subject you want to joke about, um, but comedy itself, I mean, it makes every conversation more realistic, I feel, because I don't think, you know, there's so few fantasy books, at least in the old old like the older books that have humor and in even the most dire situations, I think people have a tendency to, to make jokes either that or my friends and family are sick individuals. Um, but I mean, like no matter what's happening, someone somewhere, maybe they'll say it, maybe they won't, but has a joke. Um, and when it comes to say whether, even if it's a consoling a friend that's going through something in a book, um, you know, if characters are able to use humor as a way to get themselves through dire situations, um, then I think that's going to feel more realistic than a character who just swears revenge on whoever hurt them. Uh, now, many people in the anti-violence against women movement say that male violence is the main, if not the root cause of violence against women and girls and of violence in general. How do you think stories in books like yours can help move forward this conversation in a constructive way? Um, I think it's just up to every individual author to address, like, is you know, not necessarily address as many issues as they can, but you want to, you want to. It's important to some people, and it's important to me to put some of these issues in the book and and deal with them, um, not necessarily in a heavy-handed way, but in a constructive way that hopefully someone reading it would just at least see what's what's happened and just grasp what's going on or what's trying to be said like that mansplaining scene you know a lot of people are going to read it and just kind of gloss over it and or think it's any old character turning the tables on someone who's been a a jerk to them but you know people women being talked down on on subjects that men don't think that they know anything about is so so prevalent and so adding in scenes like that can hopefully just open people's eyes about it um, or at least make readers realize that the person that's writing that story is aware of that issue. Uh, the line between consent and coercion is not always clear in fantasy, uh, whether it's epic fantasy or urban fantasy or paranormal romance. Do you think it's an issue that writer, writers in the genre have started tackling successfully in recent years? I would say so. I mean, I think books nowadays either avoid it entirely or tackle it head on. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you've read the books, um, the Wayfair series by Becky Chambers. Um, yeah. but they, they they tackle every like every single social issue out there in the world head on in an incredibly constructive way, while blanketing it in the lore of the world itself. Uh, and they're absolutely incredible books. Um, but yeah, I think right now we're, we're kind of in a stage where people, you know, either don't do it or really do it. Uh, but hopefully we're going to a place where it just can be become a part of the fabric of every story. Um, all right. So, um, we have a question from Manifest Mechanics. Are there any female fantasy writers you'd recommend? Oh my God. Fonda <laughs> Lee, who I'm going to see tomorrow uh-huh. and I'm so excited about. I absolutely love her book. Um, Jade City, it's so unlike anything I've read before. 
Um, and my brother just finished her second one, so I've got lots of like nice things to pass on from him to her tomorrow. Um, I just finished reading a book um, by K.S. Veluso called The Wolf of Orn Yarrow. It's not out until February, but it's also an incredible book, and she lives in Canada, so I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of hers as well. Um, I just finished reading Circe by Madison, or listening to Circe by Madison Miller. It's probably pronounced Circe. Um, by Madeline Miller, that was a fantastic one as well. Uh, those Becky Chambers books, like mm -hmm. I said, are unbelievable. Um, like my Starbucks barista once asked, well, what's your book about when I set it down? And I said, it's about people caring about one another in space, uh, which is, you know, it's a crazy thing to write the premise around, but that's what it's about. Um, I think I just sounded really Canadian when I said about there, but <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, there's tons of them out there. Like. Anna Stevens, Anna Smith Spark, I mean, who's been on this program earlier. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm currently listening to Naomi Novik's Her Majesty's Dragon, just started it, but so far so great. Yeah, there are a ton out there, guys. Uh, yeah, and some people are giving our recommendations in the chat box, so that's great. Somebody said, I love Becky Chambers. Oh, so good. <laughs> um, Fiona Straffel is brilliant. That's another one. Um, Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, one more question of mine. Now, we, we were talking about um, writing just now. Uh, in your opinion, how do you think authors can strike a balance in their storytelling between raising awareness about violence against women while telling an engaging story without being pedantic or preachy? It's definitely a skill that needs to be developed and something I think that um, your your editors are going to help you with immensely if you've you know, if you've messed it up somehow. Um, I've been pretty lucky to have um, a female editor on both books so far. On the second one, I had a male and female editor. Um, and I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's something you got to be aware of going in. Um, it's, not, it's often you have to um, learn about the subject as much as you can before you address it so that you're not just flailing blindly. Um, but I think that if you do do it and you do pull it off yeah you're gonna get a little bit of flack from people sometimes but you're gonna get so much more um, feedback saying that what you wrote um, affected somebody or meant something to somebody and that's gonna be worth more than all the people that say congratulations on a very woke and quaint book which may or may not be an exact quote that someone once said to me <laughs> okay. Um, question from Arthur Illich. Have you ever found a character in a book you were reading that you just detested, and how did you cope with that feeling? Hmm. A character that I just detested. I don't, I don't really yeah. think so. No, I mean, I think if you've, if a writer makes you detest a character, then they've done a damn good job. Um, so I would love to detest a character. Uh, yeah, yeah you're, yeah, you're right, I think. I can definitely get, um, you know, if a character has no agency whatsoever and isn't, isn't, has no say about what's happening in the plot whatsoever, that can really be tiresome to me. Um, it may take me a while to grasp why I'm not connecting with that character, but that's all, inevitably the reason. So that can bother me, but otherwise, if a character is just despicable, then yay, that's great. Okay. Um, thank you again um, for all your questions, by the way. They were they were great. Yeah, thank you guys for your questions and keep them coming. Uh, so I have another question of my own uh, about geek culture. So geek culture in general, including science fiction and fantasy, it's had its share of critics saying that it's still too male-dominated, despite there being a rising number of prominent, well-respected, and well-known female authors. Plus, there's still plenty of hostile, misogynist, and sexist behavior by male geeks towards female geeks. What do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's comics or gaming or books or cons even, more welcoming for women and girls? Um, well, I think a lot of it stems from there's that trope in a lot of like, it was just pervasive in like the 80s where, and still in the 90s and still even today to some extent, where a nerdy guy with very few other redeeming qualities pines for this beautiful woman and in the end she recognizes that 
you know, the guy that she liked isn't the one for her, but this this nerdy guy has a heart of gold, and that she she'd be with him instead. And I think that's done a lot of damage um, because people feel, you know, they they in real life they you know they like someone they're like oh you can't see me for the real me you like this guy this bartender, you know, um, but it's like oh like are are you seeing the real her? You know, are you seeing, are you looking for people's inner beauty? Um, and so, yeah, it's, they're being conditioned by so many. I mean, movies are the major culprit in this, I think. Books to some extent, but movies are just nuts about it. Where, yeah, nerdy character gets the hot girl in the end. And it's, it's just, it's slowing down, but it still happens. Um, but ultimately, you know, God, yeah, you go on some of these forums and I like love video games so much. Like they're my favorite thing in the whole world. Mm -hmm. But my God, a lot of my fellow fellow video game lovers are pieces of swear insert swear word here. Um, they're just vile, and a lot of the they're just yeah, like toxic is the exact word. You go into some of these stuff, and it's just hate, 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 hate. Um, but I found that a lot of the modern, at least, developers, and like I said, publishers too. The people right now in power in the industry are um, doing a better job, and I think that they're trying to be more progressive about those things. And I and I think as um, time goes on and younger people grow up and become gamers, and obviously people of both genders and like every like everyone will will just be a part of the whole conversation. Whereas I think in the past it was very much dominated, male dominated. Um, and yeah, ultimately people that are ignorant and hateful will grow old and die. Just like everyone else, but a lot of them are older right now than younger, so. Okay. I feel the same way about vote, voters. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's gonna be around, but I think, I mean, you look at like the people that are, like, developing say video games or mm -hmm. publishing books and they are a way more diverse and open and uh, they're nicer people a lot of time than the people are, that are not playing it, their games. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so speaking of uh, games, Jay has a question about it. Uh, what's your game about? Is it related to Kings of the Wild? It is not. I unfortunately can't say what it's about okay. at all. Um, okay. But you just have to wait for it to come up. Yeah, it's not really the things of the wild. Um, but boy, would that be awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, speaking of, uh, Manifest Mechanics said, I would go broke for a graphic novel or comic version of the band of books. Uh, do you think that might happen or maybe a video game? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's possible. I've been approached by a video game, once, video game company once before, but it never went anywhere. Um, I haven't been asked to adapt a comic version of Kings of the Wild yet, although I've been asked to like maybe do other comic stuff. Um, I'd be down for any of it because I think in the you know the setting itself, um, although although like the characters and the story I really adore, but the setting itself is just so ripe for any any sort of story, especially that mm -hmm. one in Kings of the Wild. It, it does change drastically in every single book because they're meant to represent different eras of the world itself, like the world was different in the 70s than it was in the 80s than it was in the 90s. So you'd have to pick a setting to set the game in, but yeah, I would love to see any sort of adaptation of it. Okay. Um, well, we're, right, we're sort of running out of time, guys, so I don't think I can get to all your questions, but maybe a, a quick one from Arthur Elliott since we're talking about video games. Did you play Horizon Zero Dawn? I loved how the female character was written. I did play Horizon Zero Dawn, and she was written awesomely, and she's just an incredible, incredible character. And that game is mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. If you haven't played it yet, I spent, I would walk around, like, the cities in that game staring at, like, the archways and the architecture, marveling as if I was at the Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris. Like, it was the exact same feeling of wonder in that game, and it's a, it's a great one if you haven't played it yet. Cool. I, we we had a little chat before we went on air about uh, female writers and video in uh, in gaming and uh, female characters. Do you think? Uh, and I asked you a question just now about how female characters are written in novels. Do you think female characters in uh, video games are also you know sort of evolving into becoming more representative of women nowadays? Oh yeah. 
by a landslide. I mean, you look at the earliest version of Laura Croft and it was just an abomination. Um, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, well, we're going to put this 11 year old in a room and design your female character. Um, so now they're becoming a lot more well-rounded like Aloy and Horizon Zero Dawn is just incredible. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I mean, there, it's, there's so many of them nowadays and, to me, most of them are all, they're all great. And it's games like, you know, like the role-playing games like Dragon Age or Mass Effect, where you can, you know, make your character male or female, whereas in the past you were kind of shoehorned into into playing men. So uh, I think it opens a lot more avenues for, for women to play characters that feel more like themselves and for men to play characters where they, you know, empathize playing a woman in a, in a you know, in a setting where they're going to be forced to make moral choices and form relationships mm -hmm. and friendships with people. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, guys, we're not done yet. I mean, we still have a little bit more time. So, I, I see can, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As much time um, as you've got. So, I have like one or two more questions, and uh, and we'll and we're gonna. I think Nick has some uh, announcements later. So, but I will ask. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions to put into the chat box, I'm going to ask my last question. So this is your last chance, the last uh, few minutes to ask your final question while I ask mine. Uh, so Nicholas, you have been so very incredibly supportive of our Read for Pixels campaign and our anti-balance against women work as a whole. Uh, this may be a bit of an obvious question, but I'm going to ask it. Why do you support the cause to end violence against women? And what do you think authors such as yourself, can do to help with the cultural change needed to eradicate violence against women and girls. Yeah, I mean, why you're against it is, you're right, it's like incredibly obvious because it's abhorrent. Um, and I think that, I mean, it's not like every artist is obligated, but you you got to look inside yourself and, and use your old moral compass to point you in the direction that you want your art to go. And, and if, whether you're, if you're, like I have, started writing because I wanted to write stories that affected people and inspire people and and ultimately yeah you're gonna write a hopefully a rip-roaring adventure but you also want to say important things I don't want to say important things uh, and whether that's about family or whether that's about sexuality whether it's about um, treating you know women and other human beings with kindness um, despite their you know any differences that you may have um, whether they're biological or religious or racial, um, you know, I think it's it's important to me. So, I mean, you're going to see a lot more of it from me, and I suspect you'll see a lot more of it from from other people as well. Okay. Um, so, final two questions. Oh wait, there's more coming in. <laughs> when I said get your questions in, people started sure. pouring them in. <laughs> Are they all okay. from my mom? <laughs> no, no, not all famous. Okay. Uh, Jay asks, will there ever be a story about Saga when they were young? Ooh, I would love that. Um, when I first finished Kings of the Wild, when I was sending it out to people, agents, um, I started writing um, a short, like a, a collection of short stories um, that each story was written, well, I only got through one, so, or two, but it was written from the perspective of, um, of the bards that were in their band, that they always talk about their bards died in these crazy haphazard ways. So in each in each story, they had a bard with them, and then the bard died at the end of the story, um, mm -hmm. or somewhere in the story. Uh, and the very first one I wrote was Clay and Gabe at the bar, meeting Matrick for the first time, helping Ganelon out of a scrap, and you know, f deciding to become a band and call themselves. I think they called themselves Saga at the time. Um, and the second one, they were going to meet this crazy wizard one. And so, yeah, but I kind of stopped and got sidetracked by writing, obviously, other books. So someday I would love, love, love to go write a prequel. It's obviously difficult to do because everyone knows, like, the stakes are a bit not as high because you know everyone's going to live. But also, you probably know people are going to live when you're reading Kings of the Wild, too, to some extent. And the stakes don't, you don't have to know people are going to die to make the stakes high, I don't think. Um, I think it would just be great to see those people interact and and learn to see how they came to love each other so much mm -hmm. as old men. Yeah. Uh, J.A. said, that is amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, okay. 
So, okay, question from Manifest Mechanics. Did Tam ever buy Kura in your night? Ooh. Or do you have to wait to find out? Uh, <laughs> God knows if you'll ever find out. I haven't heard <laughs> of that yet. Um, yeah. Let's say no, because, you know, a knife's just going to hurt somebody. And Kura's mm -hmm. Kura's kind of get Kura, Kura kind of gets out of the game, I think, for the most part, after uh, after that. Okay, and uh, <laughs> a question from Misty: Do you have a potential title for book three? Yeah, the thing is, see, I wasn't allowed to say the title for the longest time, mm -hmm. and publishing just loves its secrets. And granted, that is entirely my fault because I'm writing the book too slow. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd know the title, you'd see the cover, you'd probably have the book in your hands. Um, but if you Google my name, it comes uh, up. Uh, <laughs> it comes okay, up guys, there. get to Googling. <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome title. Once again, I, I haven't named a single one of my books so far, but I've come close. Okay. Um, all right, uh, guys, I'm sorry if you have more questions, but I think we've come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you all for your amazing questions, uh, and thank you, Nicholas, for giving such awesome answers. Um, okay, so I'm going to put myself back on for a little while. Hi, guys. Um, now, I promised to tell you about the author goodies that we have put up on our Rally Up fundraising page, uh, which Nicholas has also contributed to. Um, like I said before, there was the Great Canadian Book and Haiku Bundle that Nicholas and Charles the Lint uh, teamed up to put together, which in, uh, con <laughs> oh there there they are. Yeah. It's uh, Bloody Rose and Kings of the Wild, uh, signed and personalized set, and uh, Charles the Lint uh, is offering one coveted spot on his exclusive haiku mailing list, which consists of only twenty five people. Now this goodie bundle has already been snapped up by Deborah Thomas, so it's gone. Sorry, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Uh, but still available is a 60-minute one-to-one chat Skype over Skype with Nicholas Eames. So if you ever want to have a chat with Nicholas about his books, about writing fantasy, uh, about where he gets all his amazing and hilarious ideas from, now is your chance. Uh, because Nicholas has donated a one-hour one-to-one Skype chat to be claimed by one Reads of Pixels donor. And Nicholas will talk to you about anything you like, uh, and he will share with you his experience and insights on writing. Uh, and this Skype call can be for a single fan or for a book club. Uh, now, there are also plenty of other author goodies available. Uh, let me tell you about them. Uh, we have stuff from Adrian Tchaikovsky, Alison Goodman, Alma Alexander, Anna Smith-Spark, Hilary Monaghan, Sarah Langan. Plus, this week is Goodie Bundle Week. So if you're looking for a special book plus swag or book plus experience bundle, we have lots of bundles of various sizes from uh, Bradley Bollier, David D. Levine, Nikki Drayden, and even Richard K. Morgan. And we also have a very special auction happening featuring some rare books from horror maestro Stephen Graham Jones. These books are so super duper rare, you can't even find them on eBay. Uh, so please do give generously, uh, all fun go towards the Pixel Project's work to help end violence against women. Now, I'm going to share a little slide with you guys with the links in it. Let's see. There we are. So guys, uh, you can donate to get these goodies on our Rally Up page. It's bit.ly slash r 4 rallyup 2019 and Stephen Graham Jones' books, uh, are, the auction page is up on SJG Charity Auction 2019. Uh, our mod chat box moderators are putting the links up in the chat box, so you can just go click on them to get where you want to go. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Read for Pixels uh, campaign, about the authors we have coming up, go to Read for Pixels. And if you want to find out more about violence against women, what you can do about it, please visit the Pixel Project website at www.thepixelproject.com. Net. Okay, so um, we're almost at the end. Nicholas, do you have some announcements? Uh, well, not so much announcements. I mean, hey, if you're into Toronto tomorrow, I'm there. Um, like I mentioned, I might have mentioned earlier, I'm going to see Fonda Lee and Evan Winter tomorrow um, mm -hmm. in Toronto. We're going to be at Back of Phoenix Bookstore. Um, and then the following day, me and Evan are going to be at the Word on the Street Festival. So I've, uh, I've read Evan's book, Rage of Dragons, and I absolutely love it. And then 
fondly I've met a few times before, and she's just amazing too. So read both of those books if you haven't yet. Okay, and uh, we, I can stick in one last question from a fan from Manifest Mechanics who asked about potential Canadian book tours for book number three. Uh, well, it's definitely too early for that. Um, you know, maybe if I get like a film and television deal before then, I'll really oh. blow up and be able to do all kinds of tours. But yeah, right now, especially living in rural Canada, it's hard to, you know, be flown anywhere. Uh, <laughs> Comic Con in England has been very gracious enough to fly me out there twice, um, and then I have a lot of. I used to live in Vancouver for 16 years, so I do get out there, um, and so Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver are my the spots where I'm going to get myself, regardless of uh, anyone else paying for me to get there. Um, but you never know. Hopefully, uh, it's just up and onward, and someday someone will shout out for me to fly somewhere fancy. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, Let's we all look across our fingers. Yes, we all we all are hoping and looking forward to that. Maybe uh, you know some fans will put up a I know March for it or something. Right. Uh, so <laughs> that I hope that answers all your questions, guys. Um, and so all that remains is for Nicholas and me to say goodbye to everybody and thank you, and and for us to say thank you, Nicholas, for doing this for us. My um, pleasure. Thanks for having me, and thanks for everyone who watched or asked questions or will watch this later and who donated to the campaign, whether it was for, for my books or for anyone else's. It's hugely appreciated. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, everybody. Good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye.